Thank you, Lord. And I suppose there are many different ways of approaching that. He's more wonderful. He's more than amazing, more than marvelous, more than miraculous. For me, well, you know, you might think he's wonderful because he walked on the water. I think he's wonderful because he looks beyond my fault and sees my need. That's why I think he's wonderful. There's a song that says, he knew me, yet, not yes, not yes, but yet. Even though he knew me, he still loved me. Well, I, my version is he knows me, yet he loves me. He knows me. And even though he knows everything about me, he still loves me. That's why he's more than wonderful to me. Amen. Walk around and just greet several people. In the name of the Lord. Grace and peace be multiplied to you, my brothers and sisters. Let us stand. We're going to be reading just the first four verses of our text, Romans chapter 6. We're looking at the entire chapter, but we're just going to read the first four verses this evening. Let me welcome everyone who is here to our Bible study. And I want to this evening welcome those who are viewing us via live stream. I just am overwhelmed at the expressions of those who watch our services on live stream and I got a call from a friend of mine who lives abroad who used to worship in Jamaica and he told me that he's been following our Bible studies from 2012 and what a blessing they have been 
And um, I'm so grateful to God that he has enabled us to have this ministry which um, is helping others. And we do give the Lord thanks. So people watching via live stream, welcome to you. And we appreciate your kind comments. And we thank the Lord that he is allowing us to be even a small blessing. Romans chapter 6. Let's read the first four verses together. Let's go. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You may be seated. Thank you so much. We noted that when a person receives New Testament salvation, a separation is effected between that person and the sinful Adamic nature that resides within the individual. We said that in effect what happens is that God uses his surgical knife to cut the believing sinner loose from his or her evil nature. And we said that this surgical process accomplishes two things. wonder if anybody could tell me what the two things are. Anybody? Something told me that I should not have asked the question. The breaking of the power of indwelling sin, that's one. And two, the impartation of the divine nature through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Are you reading the notes, brethren? We noted that this process is accomplished when we are baptized by immersion in the name of Jesus Christ. Paul says we are buried with him in baptism. And we looked at this last week and we're going to just retrace that somewhat we said that the greek word for the baptism has two basic meanings it means literally to dip or immerse and figuratively it means to be identified with and it seems that paul had both the literal and figurative meanings in his mind. For he used the experience of the Roman saints of water baptism to remind them of their identification with Christ in his death and burial. And we said that water baptism is a personal identification with Christ. It places us into Christ. Galatians 3 verse 27 says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Of course, both water baptism and spirit baptism are necessary components. 
components of the new birth. So actually, one baptism comprised of both water and spirit results in our salvation. We were baptized into Jesus Christ and in the name of Jesus Christ in order that we might be identified with him in his death on the cross. Very, very important. We said last week that baptism in Jesus' name is not a light matter. It is a very significant matter. Through our identification with Jesus on the cross, when he died, we died with reference to sin. So the power of indwelling sin has been broken in our lives. And brethren, we walk not by sight, but by faith. You cannot rely on your feelings when you live for God, feelings can be deceptive. You have to walk by faith. You have to say to yourself, this is what God has guaranteed in his word. And it doesn't matter how I feel. This is what God says he has done. If it is left up to how we feel, all of us are going to make shipwreck. You cannot serve God based on what you can see and what you can feel. Have to serve him on the basis of faith. And faith doesn't mean that, you know, you decide, I'm going to fast for 40 days. I really have never done it before, but by faith I'm going to do it. I wouldn't advise you to do that. That's not how faith works. How does faith come? Romans 10 verse 17 says, Faith cometh by hearing. And hearing what? What you went to bed and dreamed about? No. What somebody came and told you God said to you? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If God says to you, fast for 40 days, then you can do it without any fear. But if you, you know, a lot of what we say God told me to do is motivated by pride. God didn't really tell you, you know, but you want to look good. And you think that if you fast for 40 days, you will be a hero. And sometimes after the tenth day, you are a zero. When we were baptized into Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, Jesus identified us with his death. And he reckons us as being dead to sin. We must accept that and live that way. It's not a matter of how you feel or how I feel. So, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 to 12, and I'm just going to read the New Living Translation rendering. It says, Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world, rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. Here's the part now. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed what? Spiritual circumcision. The cutting away of your sinful nature. So what we have been telling you is not a fairy tale. The Bible says it is so. Christ performed a spiritual 
circumcision. The cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. And with him you were raised to new life. Because you trusted. See, see it there now brethren. You were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You trusted the mighty power of God. Some of us are trusting too much in the mighty power of me. We are trying to raise ourselves from the dead and say, let me live it. No. We must trust the mighty power of of who? Who raised Christ from the dead. If he raised Christ from the dead, he will raise you from the dead. You can't raise yourself from the dead. Tell your neighbor, you cannot do it by yourself. Tell them, stop trying to do it by yourself. You're going to frustrate yourself. Tell them, don't be a fool. If the apostles couldn't do it, you can't do it. Tell them. It's, 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 I find that it, it proves very difficult for apostolics to disengage their minds from the slavery that we are enslaved with. The slavery to self, you know, doing it ourselves. There's something fatally attractive about this. You know, it is good for us to boast that we have done this and that is why we are here. But we must trust the mighty power of God. The nature of sin, we said, must be dealt with by the knife. Our hearts must be circumcised. Without the circumcision made without hands, a sinner can never be transformed. For there is still a connection between the sinner and the sinful nature. Just by chance, there is somebody here tonight who was not here last week. Just ask the person beside you, have you been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? Just ask them. Check with them. If they say no, say to them, you should consider doing so tonight. We were baptized into his death so that we might share his burial and thus his resurrection. And in that way have his divine life imparted to us. If we have identified with Christ's death and burial. We will also identify with his resurrection. Just as God raised the man Christ from death. So we should rise from repentance and water baptism to walk in newness of life. This verse is not, mere, is not speaking merely of future bodily resurrection after physical death, but of new life now. When Paul says we should rise to walk in newness of life, he's not talking about heaven. He's talking about here and now. Your life must be different now. You should walk in newness of life now. I fear, and I fear to even mention what I fear, but I fear that some of us view heaven as a fire escape. We 
we view heaven as an escape route. We don't want to go to hell. We want to go to heaven. We can't take the fire and the burning. And somehow we have lost sight of the fact that Jesus Christ wants us to live for him now and make a difference now. We want to leave this evil world. And we will. But there is work for the church to do as long as we are here. God doesn't intend for us to sit down all day and say, I'm not moving from here for the rapture might come. So I'm looking up. Can't do no evangelism because the Lord might come. You see, if you bury what the Lord gives you and say, when him come, I just go and give him back what him give me. You might be found to be a wicked and slothful servant. No, no. God has saved us to be engaged in spiritual activity. He has saved us to go out there and shine. If you're living for God every day, you can't miss the rapture. Jesus never intended for the church to button down like we're in a hurricane and say, all right, make we just last it out. Few more years and the rapture will come. I'm going to stay right underneath this roof here. No. And I have been saying this, that the church gets into trouble when it engages more in church work than in kingdom work. Jesus used the vehicle of the church to transport us into the kingdom. When we are here, we're not, we mustn't be engaged in church activity. We must be engaged in kingdom activity. We have to be very careful, folks, because here's what happens. If you are engaged in church activity, you can become so... Ah, what's the word? Let me give you an example. And I've mentioned it before. John comes to Jesus and he says, Master... We saw one casting out devils in your name, and we forbade him. We stopped him because he's not from our group. If John was thinking about the kingdom, he would have rejoiced that somebody was being delivered. Here are persons that are demon-possessed. Bound by Satan. And because if we should use it in modern parlance, we could probably say, John said he's not from our organization. So you can't rejoice that somebody's being delivered because the person is from another organization. Or maybe he might not even be apostolic because you see, we think. That God only works with the apostolics. So anybody who is not apostolic can't be able to cast out demons. Hello? Isn't that how you think? Or you changed recently? It must be a recent change. Think about that. Remember, you know, folks, that 
at one point, a man brought his son to the disciples, you know, and said, he is vexed with a devil. Can you help me? And the Bible says they could not. But here is a man that is doing it. And because he's not from our group, we tell him to stop. That's crazy. That's madness. Jesus said to him, in my own words, you won't find this in the Bible. Jesus said to him, are you crazy? This man is doing my work. When I came, I said, that's what I've come to do. Don't look at me strange, folks. See, that's what happens when you think about church activity and not kingdom. When Jesus brought us into the kingdom by way of the church, you, you, when he, when, his first message that he taught, the Sermon on the Mount, he said, this is the way kingdom people must live. When you come into my kingdom, this is how I want you to live. Blessed is he who so and so and so. Blessed are you when so and so and so. Blessed are you when so and so and so. Love your enemies. That's how kingdom people behave. Very important, you know, brethren. Very, very important. That's not my subject tonight, but... It's very, very important. We must see ourselves as citizens of the kingdom. And anybody who is doing kingdom work, we must work alongside them and support them. Jesus said, John, you stop a man from casting out devils in my name. So here is somebody who is not from our group that has the gift of laying hands on the sick and they recover. And we are vexed because it's not we doing it. You don't say that is madness. What kind of spirit is that, brethren? People are being healed and you vex. Lord, help us. And, and brethren, you know, if we are not careful, we'll even try and invent ways to explain it away and say it's a set-up thing. Them never really possess. Them never really sick. I agree that some of it is gimmicks. But uh, you might find that apostolics have gimmick, gimmick too. It is not only we do it too sometimes. I have come to find out that. Let's let's rejoice with what God is doing in any place, through anybody, anywhere in the world. Let's rejoice. It's not our prerogative to put anybody in heaven. We're not doing that. And be careful how you put people in hell too. You know what I like about Jesus? In When he announced his agenda, in Luke chapter 4, he announced his agenda. He went into the synagogue in the place where he was brought up, Nazareth. And he read from Isaiah's prophecy about himself. Isaiah prophesied about the Messiah. And he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to do some things. And he listed them. And the last thing he said was, Preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And the Bible says when he said that, what did he do? Close the book. Now you know that Isaiah's prophecy didn't end there. 
Isaiah's prophecy ended with the last part of it says to preach the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. But Jesus didn't read that last clause. The day of vengeance of our God. When he said to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, what did he do? Can I tell you, don't open a book and start to do what when Jesus has closed the book and has stopped talking. It is our ministry is not a ministry of vengeance. Our ministry is not a ministry of condemnation. That's not your ministry. Jesus, there will be a day of vengeance. Make no mistake about it. But it is not now. And that is not the ministry of the church. Hello? Hello? I am not. We must preach judgment. We must preach, we must warn. And by the way, eh, preachers, brethren, when you stand up to preach judgment, preach it to both saint and sinner. And before you preach it, preach it to yourself. Don't preach judgment to nobody that you haven't preached to yourself. Preach judgment. Don't preach condemnation. There is a big difference. When Jesus is ready, he will go back and open the book and say, the day of vengeance of our God. Vengeance doesn't belong to the church. Didn't our Lord say, vengeance is mine? You don't have the prerogative to condemn anyone. And you can't do it. You really can't do it. In a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that God will recognize. You can do it in a way that will crush the spirit of the person. And you can even cause them to commit suicide. Through your words of vengeance. And God help us. If we have led anybody down that path. I very frequently pray. Lord if there is anyone. That I have. Represented you falsely to. Preached or taught something that was not representative of you. Please forgive me. I do that almost every message I preach or teach. I say, Lord, please forgive me. If I have represented you in a way that is not true of you. Kingdom, kingdom, kingdom. Very important. Very important. And folks, Jesus taught more about our responsibility to live out kingdom principles on earth than he talked about heaven. Read it for yourself. Don't merely believe what I say. Read the words of Jesus. Read every word of Jesus. And see how much he talked about the work of the kingdom now. He did not talk as much about heaven as he spoke about our responsibility now. Heaven will come. Heaven is guaranteed to the faithful. But don't believe that you will escape what God is bringing upon the world. Because you are in the church. Don't believe that. There is a persecution that the church has to go through. You don't believe it. Ask Paul. Ask him where his head is. Ask James. Ask him how he felt when the sword, Herod's sword went through his heart. Ask him. Ask Peter how he felt to be crucified upside down. Ask them. Ask the martyrs 
that we read about in Revelation. That say, Lord, how long before you avenge our blood? Ask them if you think it was meant to be a joy ride. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Go and do your research and find out what that means. It doesn't mean that a bullet, there's not a bullet out there with your name on it. It doesn't mean there's not a sword out there with your name on it. I wonder what um, Apostle John made of that scripture when the sword was going through his heart. One day he said, then Lord, how you say no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Then no weapon this. I wonder when Paul stood there with the axe over his head and said, Lord, then you would tell me no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I just go and beg you make iron out of my neck. I make you get Kung! and it bounces off. What do you think the stones were that killed Stephen? You don't think those were weapons? Eh? What do you think those were, folks? Weapons. Sometimes it is better them shoot you than stone you. Because sometimes one bullet can take you out. But sometimes it's holy for stone. We have to be so careful how we speak. You know? And I'm not, brethren, I'm not against quoting these scriptures, and I believe in them. It's just that I kind of have an understanding what they mean. You know, if you, if you take every, you know, for instance, the, the scripture says he, uh, uh, he keepeth all his bones. Not one of them is broken. So you now feel that you, you, none of your bones must be broken. Because he keepeth all his bones. So if you break your foot now, you say, you know, it's because I wasn't living right. Because the Lord promised to keep all my bones. You have some scriptures that are messianic. They are talking about Jesus Christ, not about you. None of his bones were broken. Remember that? They didn't break any of his bones. David was prophesying about Christ. He wasn't talking about you. You will get a broken bone every now and then. And it's not because you're sinful. Is the run-ins. We, folks, we need to live for God now. We need newness of life now, not tomorrow. Not when we are raptured. We need, our lives need to make a difference now. We must live in such a way that when people encounter us, the question that they asked concerning Jesus, they must ask it of us. When they encounter us, they must say, what manner of man is this? People like this still live now? I'm realizing that I can make a difference when I'm at the supermarket without handing out a tract. I'm not saying you mustn't hand out tracts, you know, we must. But I'm just saying I can make a difference just by the way I operate. Just using the toll road and paying the toll. I hope you have a blessed morning today. May the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And you mean it. You pronounce a blessing on them. 
You know, you're a Christian and you come to the toll booth. Hmm. And you just drive away. Oh, man. Everybody's doing that. The people of God must do it differently. You must leave a fragrance behind you. That people say, wow. It's like a fresh drink of water. But we tend to be... We, we tend to love the role of vengeance. But Jesus closed the book. Tell the person, close your, your vengeance book. The word baptized is a translation of the Greek word baptizo. Which in a mechanical sense may be defined as this is, this is how it can be defined mechanically. The introduction or placing of a person or thing into a new environment or a new union with something else so as to change its condition or its relationship to its previous environment or condition. This is one of the ways Paul uses this word in Romans chapter 6. He's saying God introduced you into a new environment, into a new union with himself. And this introduction into this new environment has changed your condition. When we sing definitely change, it is true, brethren. It's more than a song. It refers to the act of God introducing a believing sinner into a vital union with Jesus Christ in order that he or she might have the power of their sinful nature broken and the divine nature implanted through their identification with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. In this way, the con and relationship of that sinner with regard to his or her previous state and environment is changed and they are brought into a new environment the kingdom of God and that can happen in less than five minutes you can come in the most wretched of sinners and leave the most blessed of saints through the operation of God. It's not left up to us. God says, this is what I do. So, God placed us in Christ when he died. So that we might share his death and come into the benefits of that identification with him. What are the benefits? We are separated from the evil nature as part of the salvation he gives us when we believe. We were placed in a new environment. That new environment is Christ. Christ. The old environment was the first Adam. Adam was our head. Federally, he was our head. And in him, we were made sinners and came under condemnation. But in our new environ environment in Christ, we have both righteousness and life. Our condition is changed from that of a sinner. To that of a saint. So a saint is not somebody that the Catholic Church says is a saint. 
If you notice, when I'm reading and asking people to find a passage, I don't say St. Luke or St. Matthew or St. John because all of us are saints. These are not special people. If I say, let us turn to the book of St. Matthew, then I could as easily say, St. Annette is coming to lead us in prayer. St. Michael is coming to preach. St. Odin will be working on the cameras. I'm serious, you know, brethren. St. George will be going to the Leap Center. St. Lee Croft will be helping at the Golden Age home. We could do that. I could say the church is pastored by St. John. All of us are saints, not because of what we did, because of what Jesus did. This, this new environment, this new union, this new identification is what Paul spoke about in, first, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 to 13. He says, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of who? Who? Who, who have been made meet to be partakers? Paul said, us. That's you and me. We are saints. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. And hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Paul said that's what God has done. Took you from the kingdom of darkness. And translated you into the kingdom of his son. Just like that. You came to church. You, your environment was the kingdom of darkness. You responded to the message. Whoops! You're gone into a different kingdom. Just like that. Never study for it. Boom, boom. The message says, thanking the Father who makes us strong enough to take part in everything bright and beautiful that he has for us. God rescued us from dead end alleys and dark dungeons. He set us up in the kingdom of the son he loved so much the son who got us out of the pit we were in got rid of the sins we were doomed to keep repeating as we noted earlier we were not only placed in christ in order that we might share his death and thus be separated from the evil nature but we were placed in him in order that we might share his resurrection and thus have divine life imparted to us. Paul tells us this when he says that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Listen now folks, this is very important for us. It might seem trivial, but it's very important. The newness of life that Paul refers to here is a new... This is, this is, this, I, we need to backtrack. What Paul is dealing with here it is not so much a change in how we live per se. What he's focusing on is why you are able to live a changed life. He's saying something has happened to you 
that has given you the power to live a different life. Because you see, some people might ask him, then Paul, how are you just going to get up and live, live differently? So Paul is saying, that's why I am explaining to you. Before I ask you to live a changed life, listen to why you are able to do it. So, so this, this walk in newness of life refers to a new quality of life. A new quality of life imparted to the individual. And that new quality of life is what affects their conduct or behavior. Paul is not dealing with behavior now. He's dealing with that which affects the behavior. See, we like to focus on the behavior. But Paul says there is something that the saints need to understand. Why you are able to live a new type of life is because you have been baptized with something that causes you to live a new way. I'm not asking you to just get up of yourself and change the way you live. I am telling you that you have power to live differently. He's trying to take away the excuse. See, the question is, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And Paul is taking away the excuse. That's what we need to understand. Paul is saying, there is no reason why you should, because there is a factor that has been introduced that makes you different. Paul is saying, I'm not really talking about reformation. I'm talking about transformation. When in, in chapters 12 to 16, he deals with Christian behavior. If you notice how chapter 12, chapter 12 starts a new, a whole new, new subject of the book of Romans. You notice how chapter 12 starts. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Paul is saying, now look, based on all that I have told you in these 11 chapters, Based on all this teaching that you have, now I am saying to you, live differently. Because I have shown you in these 11 chapters why you are able to do it. We must not demand of people things that we have not taught them. If you have not taught your Sunday school class why they should, don't tell them that they should. Do your study. Don't be lazy. Don't go before God's people without preparing yourself. This business of coming to Sunday school just with the manual and not studying and preparing and telling people nonsense must stop. We must go before God. Don't tell children they must do that. Tell them why. When you have Call them why then you say now you know why you are able to do it. We just have a way of saying do this, do that, keep this, keep that. Why? Show me the resources that God has given me that enables me to do this. Sunday school teachers spend time before God for your class. They, 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 the little children know when we are not prepared. They come home and tell their parents. And by the way, I have a problem with people who tell me that they believe in Sunday school with all their heart. And they're a Sunday school teacher and they come late every Sunday. 
I'm just wondering how much you believe in Sunday school. That was the wrong thing to say on a Wednesday. Eh? Should call the Sunday school teachers and have a meeting. Not true. Don't just turn up on Sunday with a book and with your thoughts. That's not going to work now. It might have worked a little bit in a time gone by, but not now. You know why God's people perish? Lack of knowledge. They don't know why. They don't know how. So in chapter 12 to 16, Paul deals with behavior and conduct. But in Romans 6, he's dealing with machinery, the mechanics of the spiritual life. That's his subject. How do we live this life? How? How? I'm going to, I'm going to give you x-ray glasses so that you can look into the machinery. How God has done this. I'm telling you, and, and you have to see it now, folks. Paul is saying, th think about it. This is how the machinery works. I, I probably just use the wall because I don't want to use a person. Let's say I am the saint and this wall is the evil nature. Paul is saying before you were saved, this was how you were in your relationship to the evil nature. I'm taking you behind the scenes. I'm showing you the surgery. But when you were saved, God took out his knife and did this. You're not connected anymore. That's what has happened. That is what has happened. Now, if you want to go back and join up yourself, you can do it. But Paul is saying, I'm telling you what God did. You don't have to obey it anymore because you're not joined anymore. Remember we talked about the lamp? The lamp that you, you just plug out. That's what Paul is saying. The, the, the cord that plugged you into the evil nature, God has plugged it out. Well, if you want to plug it in again, you know, I guess you can. So this is what Paul is talking about. The newness of life refers not to a new kind of life the believer is to live. Listen carefully. That's not what he, Paul is not saying we mustn't live a new life, you know. But he's saying I'm not dealing with that here. I'm not dealing with the new kind of life you are to live. I am dealing with the new source of ethical and spiritual energy that God has imparted to you through the Holy Ghost by which you are enabled to live the life that I will tell you about in chapters 12 to 16. In chapters 12 to 16, I am going to tell you about the new kind of life that I want you to live. But right now, I am telling you that you have a new source of life imparted to you that will enable you to live the way I am telling you to live. Something has happened to you that makes you different. It wasn't there before, but since you are saved, it is there now. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how? How? Shall we that are dead? Paul 
Paul is saying in effect that we were identified with Christ in his resurrection that we may conduct our lives in the energy of the new life that is imparted to us through the indwelling Holy Spirit. Ask the person beside you, did you receive the Holy Ghost? Tell them if you haven't, you need to think about it very seriously. So here we have the twofold result of the major surgical operation that God performs in the inner being of the sinner when he places his trust in the Savior. That person is disengaged from the evil nature, separated from it, no longer compelled to obey it. He has parted to him the divine nature which second peter 1 verse 4 tells us about and this divine nature becomes in him the new source of ethical moral and spiritual life which causes him to hate sin and causes him to love righteousness which gives him both the desire and the power to do God's will. Before we were saved, brethren, we might have had the desire to do God's will, but we didn't have the power. We need to understand that we have the power now. It's not a power to speak in tongues. It's not a power to run up and down in church. It's a power to live right. So now, if I find myself starting to love sin again and hating righteousness, what I have to check now is if I have reattached myself to what Jesus separated me from. That could be one of the reasons. Or it could be that I've never really understood that I'm not connected anymore and I don't have to obey. I can't say no. I have the power now to say no. That's why it's important for us to teach us these things, brethren. We need to know that we can, and when we say no, heaven backs us up. So, so this is what we have been trying to say in Philippians 2, 12 to 13. We have been trying to say this for maybe two years now. You know? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Yes. The other thing that we need to understand is, folks, and just let me take the time to say this so it might help you. How many here have ever written a letter or sent an email? Maybe you haven't posted a letter, but you have written a letter by way of email. How many has done that? Put your hand up. All right. When you do that, have you ever written one and said chapter 1, verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, verse 4, verse 5? That's how you write your letters? Don't you just write? Brethren, think about it, please. Think about it. When Paul and the other brethren wrote their letters, they didn't write chapter 1, verse 1, so and so. Is we do that. Paul didn't, nobody don't write a letter like that. So, here's, here's what I would say, brethren. See, especially when you're reading letters, the epistles are letters. You see, when you're reading them, 
sit down and read them off in one setting. Just sit down and read them like how you would read any other letter. That's really the best way to deal with the epistles. Because that's what they are, letters. So just sit down and don't say, I'm going to read chapter 1 today. I know we have our daily Bible reading. And that is better than nothing. But the best way to start reading the epistles is to just sit down like you're dealing with Romans. Just sit down at one time and just read off the entire thing as you would read any normal letter that you got from your husband or your wife. Or your fiancé. Because those we really read. Sometimes wife and husband will not read it so much. But if it's ever the fiancé that we're really in love with and don't marry to yet. Anything, Sister Lisa, write me, I read it, you know. Right away, too. Same time, I don't make sure she do, you know. Because I don't want her to feel like me have to read it. <laughs> but I go one side and read it. And she, she will say to me later, you read what I wrote to you? Yes. Like I'm saying, you know, I never kill myself to read it. But me really did kill myself to read it. You know. All right, you see, I will give her some power over me now. She's laughing all the way home now, you know. Lord, help me. So, folks, why am I saying this? Because you can go really bad if you take one verse and pull it out, out of its context, and don't look at what was said before and after. So you can make a big doctrine over one verse. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, and that's where it stops. But Paul never said it like that. Let's look how the Amplified Bible speaks about these two verses. Therefore, my dear ones, as you have always obeyed my suggestions, so now, not only with the enthusiasm you would show in my presence, but much more because I am absent, work out, cultivate, carry out to the goal, and fully complete your own salvation with reverence and awe and trembling. What does that mean? Self-distrust with serious caution, tenderness of conscience, watchfulness against temptation, timidly shrinking from whatever might offend God and discredit the name of Christ. Not in your own strength. Uh-oh. That disappoint us now. Not in your own strength. For it is God who is all the while effectually at work in you. All the while effectually at work in you. Energizing and creating in you the power and desire both to will and to work for his good pleasure and satisfaction and delight. Tell your neighbor, God is working in you. Say to them, just allow him to continue his work. That's how you work out your own salvation, by allowing God who who is giving you the energy and the desire to work out it, that in you. The will of the born again child of God has been made absolutely free. Brethren, this is true. I don't care how you feel. Before salvation... The will of the born again child of God was not free so far as choosing between good and evil is concerned. It was enslaved to the sinful nature. But now, since the separation, it stands poised between.
between the sinful nature and the divine nature with the responsibility to reject the suggestions, enticements, and commands of the sinful nature and obey the pleadings, exhortations, and warnings of the Holy Spirit. To constantly say no to the sinful nature and yes to the divine nature becomes a habit and then the victorious life has been reached. That's how it works, folks. You are not a slave anymore. Let me show you this now. Because... I don't like sometimes, we see, we get so emotional that we think we can plead the blood over everything. And it doesn't work like that. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 17 to 18. Could you put that on the screen for me, brethren? The New Living Translation. This, I am reading for all of those who think you can blood your way through everything. And folks, I, I really am not concerned about other people doing other assemblies, you know. That's not my concern. Well, I mean, I'm concerned, but I can't really do anything about it. I am responsible for Pentecostal tabernacle. So if you go and hear people just blooding up people and blooding up things, I expect you to, tell, to, to, to say to yourself, that's not how it works. Listen to what Paul says here now. Dear brothers and sisters, after we were separated from you for a little while, though our hearts never left you, we tried very hard to come back because of our intense longing to see you again. Verse 18. We wanted very much to come to you. And I, Paul, tried again and again. But Satan did what? So, like how Paul was a big time apostle now. Why do you think he never just blood up Satan? Like some of you would do. How come he never do that? What do you think caused him not to blood him up? Like how somebody says something to, to you that you don't like and you just, I may just blood him up. I hate to hear it. You see, it sounds so dunce. You would think you never went to a spiritual school. This was a fact. Paul said Satan prevented us. Whether you like it or not, it's there on record. Let me tell you how the thing works now. James chapter 4. Same NLT. James chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. This is what James says. But he gives us even more grace to stand against such evil desires. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but favors the humble. Verse 7, so humble yourselves before God. What you must do? Blood him up or, or resist? Resist. And what happens when you resist? You know what that word flee means? Eh? When you resist. Only good for a short sprint, boy. <laughs> 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 
Well, it was good while it lasted. See, see, brethren, go back to verse 7. See, part of the problem is that we're not humbling ourselves before God. And you can only resist the devil when we humble ourselves before God. Resist the devil. No! No! If thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Throw yourself down from this pinnacle here. Because the word says. The Lord will bear you up in his arms. It is written. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord. That. Three temptations. Three times resisting. They've left him. Can't manage you right now. I forgot to wait and come back. Verse 8, just to close out this. See, come close to God. And what happens? God, God will, that's, that's, that's for sure. That's what the scripture says. If you decide to draw near to God, you don't have to worry. Right now, if you, if you are a million miles away, just start the process. I don't care how far you are from God tonight. If you draw near, the scripture says, God not going to say, oh, you, you just feel like you can't draw. No, God going to say, you come in, we come in too. We must meet up. Because I'm not going to stop come. So if you continue, we're going to meet. And it's going to be like how it was before. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. For what? Ah, your loyalty is divided between God and the world. So you're not saying no with enough conviction because your loyalty divided. See that, brethren? So Paul has answered the question, shall we as a habit of life continue to sustain the same relationship to the evil nature that we sustained before salvation? That's the question. Shall we continue like this? He's saying this is almost a mechanical impossibility for two reasons. First, this brethren, you must be able to re rehearse this, you know. Two reasons why we cannot continue in sin that grace may abound. Number one, the power of the sinful nature has been broken. And I am not compelled to sin. Second, I have the Holy Ghost. The divine nature has been imparted. And not only now am I not compelled to, but I don't want to sin. When a person does not have to do something, which he does not want to do. He simply does not do it. We conclude lesson three by stating that it is vital that every saint understands and embraces the fact that as a result of the spiritual surgery that was performed by God at the moment of his or her salvation, the saint has a new relationship to sin. She or she is dead to sin. Paul says this in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. That's a fact. That's a fact. I have been crucified with Christ. In him I have shared his crucif crucifixion. It is no longer I who live. But Christ, the Messiah, 
lives in me. That is where the apostolic church has the major part of its problem. We don't recognize that. We crucified with Christ as a fact, but we still think is we live in. It is no longer I who live, but Christ the Messiah lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in, by adherence to, and reliance on, and complete trust in the Son of God. That's how we must live our life. Who loved me and gave himself up for me. Tell, touch yourself and say, I am dead. I am dead. Call your name, your first name, and say you are dead. That's a fact. It happened. John Mark, you're dead. When Christ went to the cross, he carried you there. Not just your sin, you. If an alcoholic dies, think about this. Some of us used to drink rum before we were saved. Not true. And we're alcoholics. Isn't it true? Isn't it true? Yes. Talk all kind of foolishness and act all kind of way. Eh? Like the man who walk into a house. Drunk and just walk into a house. And tell a man must come with him. Eh? 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 I say that, I say that sofa uh, is my sofa, you know. So I say that TV, uh, uh, my TV, you know. And, and then him go upstairs. I'm say, you see that that door there? Is the door to my bedroom, you know? And him going and say, you see that lady there, sleeping on the bed? It's my wife, you know. And, and you see that man sleeping beside her? It's me. <laughs> Come on, saints. We are in the house of the Lord. Behave yourself now. Let us get back to serious business. Think about that. I gave you that example for a reason still, you know. Now that same man dies. He's dead. Physically dead. Can no longer be tempted by alcohol. His body is dead to all physical senses. Can't see. Can't smell. Can't taste, can't desire the alcohol. Dead. In Jesus Christ, we have died to sin. So that we no longer want to continue in sin. There's no reason why you should want to continue in sin. People were saying to Paul, Paul, you are saying that is grace about now, and we are no longer under the law. So since we're not under the law, we don't come to that part yet. That was the second question, you know. Remember, it's two questions he asked. We're coming to that in verse 15. That question was, since we're not under law, we can live any way we want to. Since it's grace ruling, and Paul said, no, you don't understand grace. Grace is more severe than law. Because law couldn't teach you anything. Law just stand out there and said, don't do this and don't do that. But law had no power. Folks, rules cannot make you live for God. I'm sorry. Somebody has to tell you. It can't. What makes you live for God? The grace of God that bringeth salvation 
hath appeared to all men, teaching us. If the grace you have not teaching you to deny ungodliness and worldly loss is not the grace of God you have. Don't tell lie on God. Grace does not promote sinfulness. Grace teaches you that denying ungodliness and worldly loss, we should live soberly. Come again. Righteously. Soberly. In reference to myself. Righteously in reference to my brothers and sisters. And other people that I meet. And godly in reference to God. In this present world. Grace does that. Not rules. So if you say. That you can live any way you want. Because you're under grace. You are a liar. Because grace says, live right. Live right. All Paul is saying is not a rule book anymore. It's the Holy Ghost that has been imparted to you. And God has cut away your desire. Let's lift our hands and worship Jesus. If grace can't make you live for God, you'll never live for God. Never. I'm telling you folks, you will never. But we are not only dead to sin. We are also alive in Christ. We have been raised from the dead and now walk in the power of his resurrection. We walk in newness of life because we share his life. And this truth is exemplified in the story of Lazarus in John 11. When, John, when Jesus arrived at Bethany, Lazarus had been dead for four days. That's verse 39. There was no question about his death. By the power of his word, Lazarus came forth. Verse 43. Jesus raised his friend from the dead. But when Lazarus appeared... He was wrapped in grave clothes. So Jesus commanded, loose him and let him go. He had been raised to walk in newness of life. In John 12, Lazarus was seated with Christ at the table in fellowship with him. We see Lazarus dead, raised from the dead, set free to walk in newness of life and seated with Christ. All of these facts illustrate the spiritual truths of our identification with Christ as given in Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. You read it. We are seated together in heavenly places. See, Lazarus raised from the dead now, and the feast is given, and he's sitting at the table with Jesus. Colossians 3, 1 to 3, in that passage, Paul says, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. You know what that means, folks? It, no, it don't mean to think about streets of gold, you know, and think about mansions, you know. What it means is, what Paul is saying is, remember how Jesus taught us to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so on earth. Paul said, think about that. Think about the things in heaven. Think about how the angels respond to the commands of God. You who are on earth, live that way. Think about how heaven is ordered. No, no disruption of God's will. Everything in perfect harmony. That's how I want you to live. Paul is not saying, all you, you go along, you must just think about the mansion you're going to get. Think about the street. No. 
Paul is saying, no, 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 no. Think about how heaven operates and try and operate like that on earth. For you died to this life. And your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Who is your life, folks? Christ. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. It is clear then that the saint cannot deliberately live in sin. Since he or she has a new relationship to sin. Because of his or her identification with Christ. They have died to the old life and have been raised to enjoy a new life. They do not want to go back into sin any more than Lazarus wanted to go back into the tomb dressed again in his grave clothes. Think about that. Since we are identified with our Lord in his death, we shall not continue in sin that grace may abound. Can we make that pledge tonight? Since we are all dead people, we must say, I will not continue in sin that grace may abound. When we were justified, that wasn't the end of the story. Our justification is a means to a greater end, holiness of life. holiness of life. That's why we were justified. We have been accepted by God that we may be possessed by God. We have been set free in order that we may walk with God, not walk away from him. Because we are justified, we are to be holy, separated from sin, separated to God. Not merely as an identification that our faith is real and therefore that we are legally safe, but because we were justified for this very purpose that we might be holy. God has promised resurrection life and power for our activities in this present life. We must not believe that consistent victory over sin is reserved only for the future. My brothers and sisters, we must not allow ourselves to be confused because we find sin warring in our members, that war will go on. Because the sinful nature has been left there. But you must understand that you, are not, you don't have to obey. We need to understand that when we receive New Testament salvation, our identification with the Lord Jesus Christ in his death was actualized. It became a living reality. Our identification with him in his glorious resurrection was also actualized. It became a living reality also. We must live our lives in such a manner as to demonstrate that we have embraced these realities. The way I live my life must say to the people who are looking on, he's dead to sin. Obviously he's dead. And it must also say to them, obviously a new life has been imparted to him. When we do that, folks, we will begin to look beyond what we can see with our physical eyes and see how people are living their lives. Folks, listen, this world is messed up, you know. You know that you have people that have tattoos all over their body from head to foot. You know that? Some of them cannot really be removed, you know. So when they come and get saved now, what are we going to do? You cannot sing in the choir with your tattoo. We 
have to start thinking about that. Uh oh. What going to happen? Let's stand and lift our hands and worship the Lord. Forget about that little last part. And just worship for the first part. Worship him some more. Worship him until you understand that you are dead. You are, God did the surgery. It has been done. Accept it. Tell yourself, I do not have to continue to obey the commands of the sinful nature. I do not have to. I can say no. I have been set free. When the slaves were set free, they were wondering, what must we do now? You need to tell yourself, I don't have to live on my former master's property. I don't have to feel this, the chains holding me no more. They have been broken. I lived so long as a slave that I, now I'm going to have to learn to live as a free man. That's why we have the word to help us. To start thinking differently. Because you can't live differently until you start thinking differently. And none but ourselves can free our minds. You may be seated. Ushers, would you come please quickly? We want to give the Lord thanks for his goodness, for his mercy. Praise the Lord. I would like to meet with Brother Varden Downer, Brother Damian Burrell, Brother Matthew Royal. Could you come and see me, please? Very brief meeting. On Saturday at 12, the funeral service for... The brother of Sister Vassal, Sister Austin, and Brother Austin will be held at the Discovery Bay Pentecostal Church, Top Bay in St. Anne. That's on Saturday at 12. Then the Thanksgiving service for Bishop John Hewitt will be held at Bethel United Church on Saturday, July 18. 12 noon. Funeral service for Sister Annie Henderson, which was scheduled for this Saturday, has been rescheduled to next week, Thursday, at 10 a.m. So Sister Annie Henderson's Thanksgiving service will be held on Thursday at 10 Funeral service for the brother of Sister Gloria Thorpe will be held at the North Street Seventh-day Adventist Church this Sunday at 1 p.m. And we are asking all of us to pray for the bereaved family members. One of our ministers in the United Pentecostal Church, Brother Gently Campbell, his wife passed away suddenly uh, last week, I believe. And so it could have been Monday. And so he's bereaved. Let's pray for Brother Campbell and all the family members. 
members of the Golden Age Choir who sang at Brother Rob's funeral service, you are being asked to meet with Sister Williams, who was Sister Hemans before, but now is Williams. You are to meet with her on Sunday morning at the usual spot. Brother Smith is back in the hospital, Ward 8. That's Sister Lorna Smith's husband. He's at Ward 8 of the University Hospital. Let us pray for him. I'm going to just leave the other announcements. They can be read on Sunday in Sunday school. Let's stand, please, brethren. Let's, brethren, I'm going to ask you to let's pray about, you know, the Lord helping us to do his work in these last days in a very conscientious way, in a way that is pregnant with burden and compassion for the lost. We have to walk a very, a very careful road as we go forward. We have to remember that the Lord has asked us, our business is the making of, the, of disciples. Not just the saving of a soul, but the making of a disciple. Making of a disciple. That's what God wants. Not just a whole bunch of people who are here and said they are saved, but haven't been discipled. So we must have a missionary zeal, but we must have a discipling zeal. Because, folks, whether you want to believe it or not, the Pharisees were very zealous soul winners. Very zealous. They were not careless about souls. Jesus said of them, you compass land and sea to make one convert. You, you will cross the, the seas to win a soul. That was very commendable. But guess what he said? When he's converted, he's twice time the child of the devil that you are. Because you not right. When him gets saved, it was better he, you hadn't reached him. We can't afford for that to happen. Eh? We can't disciple. We must... The persons that come here must be disciples of Jesus Christ more than anything else. Not of a movement, not of a church. They must be disciples of Jesus Christ. So we must increasingly reflect Jesus Christ in our lives. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your super abundant grace. Amazing grace. Grace that we cannot fathom. Grace that translated us from the power of darkness to the kingdom of your son. Grace that cut us away from attachment to the sinful nature. Grace that is trying to teach us to live right. Grace that is trying to get us ready, not just for heaven, but for right living here on earth. Help us, Lord, to understand that we are dead. Help us to understand that we are not slaves anymore. Help us to understand that even though in our minds we still retain a memory of the chains and a memory of our slave master, we are in fact free. 
And when we hear the command, help us to understand that we don't have to obey it anymore. There was a time when we had to, but now we are free. Help that to become a settled truth in our spirits. Help us, Lord, to allow the Holy Spirit to live out his beautiful life in us. Help us, Lord, to allow the Holy Spirit to leave a fragrance behind wherever we go so that the attitudes and the spirit and the carnality of our former life will be no more. Less and less every day we should be acting in that way. More and more our spirits should be in harmony with what you are doing. Help us increasingly to be able to say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in my life as it is in heaven. In my life, Lord, be glorified. Be glorified today. Bless the offering that has been received, Lord. Help it to be used for the multiplication of the work of the kingdom of God as we go Go with us. Bless and keep and strengthen all those who are grieving, Lord. All the people who are grieving, we pray. We commit ourselves into your hands in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please greet somebody. Um, Brother Delroy Peter is here. Sister Jackie Peter is here. We're so happy to see you. We, are, we, we wish you wouldn't, you wouldn't leave us. Just stay with us until the rapture. And all those who are visiting with us, we are so glad to have you. Those who are to meet with us, just come on the choir loft, please. Picnic reminder, folks. Let's listen. Praise the Lord, everyone. Just to remind you of our picnic coming up at August 1, Kirk Vine, the location. $1,200 for taking the bus. And if you are going to carpool, it's $200 for entry. And we are asking, uh, try and carpool. Remember, the funds does not include food. So you have to carry your own food. Lord bless you.